Good evening. Welcome to Q&A live from the Deakin Edge, the Melbourne, Sydney, I beg your pardon, the Melbourne Writers' Festival. I'm Tony Jones, definitely in Melbourne. Uh, answering your questions tonight, the host of the Wheeler's Centre's Fifth Estate, Sally Warhaft. The Minister for Workplace Relations and Education, Bill Shorten. The Institute of Public Affairs, Tim Wilson. British Labor MP Tom Watson, who spearheaded the inquiry into phone hacking and Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation. And the Liberal member for Higgins, Kelly O'Dwyer. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. And as usual, Q&A is being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. You can join the Twitter conversation with a hashtag on your screen. Well, usually we like to, court, we like to talk literature, uh, if we can talk, during our annual visit to the Melbourne Writers' Festival. Tonight, with less than two weeks of the federal election, it's all about politics. And our first question tonight comes from Daniel Komisarov. Good evening. One of the more unexpected moments of the Rudd-Abbott debate last week was Tony Abbott asking, does this guy ever shut up? Was this a strategic ploy by Tony Abbott to ridicule Prime Minister Rudd's long-winded responses or an accidental remark in the heat of argument? Sally Warhaft, what do you think? I don't really care, I suppose, <laughs> whether it was scripted or not. Um, I care about an idea, I suppose, that anything at length you know, we criticise, but then we criticise it because it's 10 second soundbite as well. Um, so, you know, was it scripted? Well, we'll probably find out one day. Um, and we really all won't care by then. I care more, I think, about some of the other mantras that are going on in this election. And um, I think about, you know, Tony Abbott. Uh, the, the thing I've sort of repeatedly heard him say is, we want to help you help yourselves. And I just think, this fits into this age of entitlement and selfishness. There is absolutely nothing in this election from either side about how can we help you help someone else, <laughs> do anything for someone else. Um, so, you know, that's one mantra that really troubles me. Uh, another one, I'm afraid, from uh, your side, Bill, would be, um, you know, <laughs> the new way, a new way. Who thought of that? What drug were they on? Uh, it's, I mean, the new way, all it does is make you think of the old way. And I would have thought that's precisely what the Labor Party wouldn't want us to be remembering right now. So, um, again, these things, you know, we, we focus on the things that shouldn't matter. Tim Wilson, I'll bring you back to the actual question. Uh, does this guy ever shut up, uh, was what Tony Abbott said. Do you think it was a ploy? Or do you think it was pre-scripted? Well, if it wasn't pre-scripted, then you'd certainly think you'd want to pre-script it in the future because I think it cut through very clearly for a lot of people in Australia. I was watching that debate like everybody else uh, while cooking dinner and I just sort of watched it and I watched the verbose way that Kevin Rudd uh, tried to behave like a year t like he's auditioning for a year 10 debating coach position. And I think it actually cut through very strongly. I doubt it probably was scripted, but it may have been. Uh, and it had an impact because it basically resonated with what the public thinks, which is that Kevin Rudd has had plenty of go. He's always out there talking, but how much of it actually amounts to substance and resonates with the public and actually shows their concern at the moment. I know we've got Tom on the panel tonight. But in reality, him going around uh, worrying about what Rupert Murdoch's saying or what he's doing in different uh, we'll places that doesn't now. connect <laughs> with average people. And that's why I think he's uh, performing well. There are Bill many Shorten. reasons why he's performing poorly in the polls, but that is one of them. Bill Shorten. I genuinely don't know. Um, the conspiracy theorists say that uh, when there was a negative reaction to him being, you know, uh, losing his cool a little bit with Kevin Rudd, uh, I, the the conspiracy theorist said, oh no, Kevin Rudd fell into Tony Abbott's well-laid trap that Tony Abbott was really showing that he doesn't like how much Kevin Rudd talks. I just don't know. Uh, the point that Kevin Rudd was making to Tony Abbott so we don't lose, picking up what Sally said, let's not lose sight of the, the superficial issue, the tip of the iceberg and go to the substance, is as I recall, Kevin Rudd was asking Tony Abbott, how are you going to pay for all your promises? And at that point, then Tony Abbott said, oh, doesn't this guy ever shut up? Now, for the people who don't like Kevin Rudd, what Tony Abbott said was great, you cheer, great, yeah, that's what I want to say to him. But for a lot of other people, they're saying, how will Tony Abbott pay for some of the propositions like their paid parental leave scheme? How will they pay for uh, extra government services when they're handing back the mining tax to uh, the richest mining companies in the world? So I don't know. If you like Kevin Rudd, you probably didn't like what Tony Abbott said. 
If you like Tony Abbott, you probably liked what he said. For me, though, the question is, what about the policy? What about the substance of the matter? And Bill Shorten, let me interrupt. What about the debate? Uh, because you can't seem to take a trick in this campaign. And Kevin Rudd actually wins this debate, but all the coverage is about the shut-up line and what a makeup artist said. Yeah, you're right. Um, it is difficult. But what I also know is that if you settle for second, you'll never come first. Can I just say to all those people who are backing Labor, Labor hasn't given up this election in the slightest. Can I say to those people who are conservative, we get that you're doing well and you want to see a change of government, but can I also say to those people who are either disengaged or not sure, hang in there for the next 11 days because, and perhaps even tonight, let's get the real issues about where this country's going. The Liberals want to turn this election into a referendum about what you think about Labor. If we want to have a competition between Liberal and Labor about who's got the best plans for the next three years. So there's still some time to go in this competition. And, it, and I, even though I notice some of the Libs are getting a bit confident that it's all over by the shouting, can I just assure you the Labor Party is going to fight this out right down to 6pm on Saturday, September the 7th. And hang on, there's still a lot more to go in this argument yet. Kelly O'Dwyer. <laughs> I'll just bring you back to the question as well. Well, well, I suppose, I, I don't know, I haven't spoken to Tony about it, but I thought it was a very authentic moment in the debate. I thought he said what so many people were feeling in their living rooms right around the country, those people who were actually watching the debate, and I'm afraid there probably were less of those people than we might like to think. Um, but to, to the point that, that Bill was making before... I suppose you put it on Sky TV, perhaps. <laughs> well, look, Tony, you can put in a plug for the ABC all you like, and I'm very sure that... I'm very sure okay. that there would be... Um, we can. There, <laughs> I'm very sure that there would be many debates uh, that we would have here on the ABC as we're having tonight, which I think is a very good thing. OK, let's go back to the question. And uh, the, the Brisbane Courier-Mail certainly picked up that line, put it all over their front page, down one side, and the banner headline with... Kevin Rudd on the other, does this man ever shut up? How does it feel to have the Courier-Mail on your side and possibly its owner as well? Well, well look, I, I don't think it's a matter of the owner being on side or the editor being on side or the journalist being on side. I think it's a reflection of the judgment of the paper as to how they saw the debate that night. I mean, it could just be that people actually feel this. I mean, let's, let's actually look at some of his colleagues and what they've said about Kevin Rudd. Some of his colleagues, like Steve Gibbons, who's retiring, said that Kevin Rudd's a psychopath. A third of his cabinet wouldn't actually stay on and serve with him because they feel the same way. Um, we've had numerous incidents where we've seen Kevin Rudd completely lose it, whether it's with flight attendants, whether it's with officials, whether it's with the makeup artist, as we heard only last week. I mean, we, we've got somebody here. In that, in that clearly... case, he appears to have lost it by not actually saying anything to it. Well, well, no, clearly. Very cunning. Clearly. Very cunning. Clearly. <laughs> well, clearly, I mean, you might laugh about it, but I think you have to treat laughing, everybody just... with respect. I agree. And I think no matter who they are, you must treat them with respect. And clearly, in this instance, um, the makeup artist involved did not feel that she had been treated with respect. And this is a common pattern when it comes to Kevin Rudd, that his, his persona in front of a crowd, his persona with important people is very different to his persona with people who he thinks are beneath him. And that's where we get this Dr Jekyll, Mr Hyde personality that we see with Kevin Rudd, that most of his colleagues have said, you know what, too much even for us. With the OK, third all right, I'm going to stop you there. We'll go to our next question, which is on the subject I just wrote. It is from Natalia Antalak Sapa. Since 2013 election campaign started, the Murdoch print media has elected to engage in one of the most targeted partisan propaganda campaigns in Australian political history. What are some mechanisms, whether regulatory or otherwise, to ensure a more balanced role for the media to play during coverage of political campaigns? Thank you. Tom Watson, I'll start with you. Well, look, uh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for asking it. And in the UK, when we looked at this, we, we had this huge scandal with News Corporation in the UK, 130 arrests. Uh, you, you know, a journalist working for the best-selling newspaper in the UK hacked the phone of an abducted teenage schoolgirl, which horrified the nation. And whatever your politics in the audience tonight, you, you know, I'm sure people would be horrified to think that a corporate culture could exist that allowed that to happen. And we're looking at three strands of uh, reform. We're looking at ethics in journalism, we're looking at regulation, and we're looking at ownership. And the key issue for me in the UK is ownership. And the reason that scandal happened in the UK was Rupert Murdoch just got too powerful to the point where 
his journalists felt that not only were they beyond account to politics, but they were beyond the law and that they could ignore the law in our country. And we're dealing with that now, but it's been very painful and it's been very hard for us to deal with that. And which is why I was genuinely shocked. You know, you have that last question about the media hook. Well, I don't think your leader showed very great respect to Kevin Rudd, nor you in your answer there, Kelly. But, and it demeans politics when you have that kind of, uh, you have that kind of response, you know. I don't know whether Tony Abbott answered that question uh, on, the, on the hoof, but he would have known that he's been around enough to know that that was a media hook. And spin doctors in the UK would say that's a media hook that allows talking points and papers like the Courier Mail seized on it. And instead of having a debate about what's great for Australia and families in Australia and what kind of future they want, we're having a debate about the character of the people who seek to represent their country and do the best for their country. Tom Watson, and I think that's a real shame. Let, let me, uh, before I move to the other panellists, I, I, we do obviously have to ask the obvious question, why are you here? Um, are you here sure. to support <laughs> yeah. the uh, Labour Party? I mean, are you carrying no, uh, a global jihad against no, Bill, Murdoch? Bill, Bill, is, uh, Bill, Bill is the first Labour politician I've met since I got to Australia. Uh, uh, I'm actually here with the global campaign group of ours. I've worked with them in, uh, in the United States and in the UK and I've come over to listen to what people think about how Rupert Murdoch runs his media in Australia and uh, I'm already getting a great deal of feedback from the people that I've met uh, over the last three days. So, and one obvious question, have you been brought out here by competitors of Rupert Murdoch? No, I've, been, I've come out with a campaign group of ours who, want to, who seek to challenge Rupert Murdoch and look at the corporate culture across different continents. So, uh, and and uh, I'm hoping to see some long-distant relatives while I'm out here as well, Tony, I if that's OK. OK. Tim Wilson. <laughs> News Corp obviously got up to some things, or, or I'll be very technically specific, News International in the UK got up to some things which were untoward and not just limited to them, but also, of course, to the culture within uh, the UK tabloids, uh, which did deserve to be investigated and did deserve uh, to have scrutiny. But we haven't had anything like that in Australia. And to try and use that as a justification to beat up on Rupert Murdoch on News Limited is quite fanciful, to be quite, uh, be quite factual. It's... In this election campaign, News Limited has done what the uh, Fairfax Press has done just as much themselves, which is to take a position, to stand out on that position and to communicate to the public what they think about the state of both the political parties. And I just need to read to you, right from the front page of the Australian Financial Review on the day of the election... As long the, as it's brief. Very brief. Under both Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, Labor has shown itself to be structurally unfit to govern. That is a Fairfax newspaper editorialising right from the outset what they think. And the point is that the government has problems. It has nothing to do with whether Rupert Murdoch was involved or not. And if you don't like the newspapers that are produced, buy something else. But there should be zero regulation on the, me uh, the media in terms of balance. There should not be a sense of fair media. We should have a free media because every time regulation is introduced to limit free speech and limit a free media, it ends up being used for political purposes. You know, uh, Bill over here was supportive of media regulation that was proposed which would dramatically silence free speech in a fair press by making sure that uh, there were uh, appropriate tests, or inappropriate tests I should say, on who could own media outlets uh, and that would only end up being used for political, be uh, for political consequences. So okay. what's the answer to your question is there should be zero media regulation in this space. Before Tim spoke, I was listening to both Tom and to Natalie. Listening to Tim, you'd think that somehow uh, News Limited's been sinned against and that they're outnumbered by the uh, Labor government. Let's be really clear. We are seeing a departure in this election from what a lot of us in Australia are used to. Am I used to the Financial Review editorial bagging out representatives of workers? Yes, that is not a news flash. But what we are not seeing, or what we are seeing for the first time, is when you have the Courier Mail and the Daily Telegraph practically from the first day of election, editorialising, thundering from the front pages, throw the mob out, the sergeant, in Sydney they had the Daily Telegraph with a Sergeant Schultz, uh, Hogan's Heroes, which was a show from the 60s and 70s, which probably went over the heads of some of Gen Y anyway. But mind you, they're not reading newspapers anymore. Um, the, we're seeing the Americanisation and indeed the uh, Englishisation of our newspapers where you're seeing a very strong political editorial flavour taken from day one. This is something 
newer and less common than it's been in the past. And um, my answer, though, to the lady's question, to come back to where it all started, is there are 15 million people voting in this election. I get that the editorial policy of quite a few of uh, News Limited's papers is against Labor. But what they can't do is tell 15 million people how to think. At the end of the day, we in Labor have to rely upon the fact that there's 15 million people, many of whom will make up their own minds independent of the newspapers, but it certainly does increase the degree of difficulty which Labor faces as the underdog in this election. But Bill, would you concede that these newspapers reflect the sentiment within the state? So in, in Daily Telegraph and New South Wales, they're far more aggressive on the Labor Party than they are in Victoria, for instance, the Herald Sun, where the sentiment may be different. The idea that somehow they're going on some grand sojourn and they're not reflecting their audience and what they think is, uh, or from a business standpoint at least for them, madness. They have to reflect the sentiment within the community to make sure people are buying their newspapers and that's the reason they're going down this path, not... Well, it's a fair question you raise. For bias. Um, I do not believe that 100% of Daily Telegraph readers or 100% of people who buy the Courier Mail, especially in one newspaper towns, all agree with the editorial content. If I did that, then I'd be truly pessimistic about this out the outcome of this election, which I'm not. What I don't get, though, is when a newspaper has such a... It, when, it, when its editorial content moves from being an objective reporter to a cheer squad for one cause or the other, you know, I'll still get up in the morning and look after workers and do the things we think are important. What worries me is what they actually think of their readers, that they're not even reflecting them anymore. And what you're seeing is the opinions of the few being put on the many. And I just think in Australia, one of the things which makes our democracy special is that at the end of the day, the less we have people shouting at people and telling them what to do, and the more we let people try and work issues out themselves, the better quality outcomes we get in Australia. I'm just going to... Uh, thank you. Thank you. And we've got another question on this topic. We'll go to that before we bring the other panellists in. It's from David Anderson. David Anderson. It seems to me that the issue of media domination by the Murdoch empire and the complete one-sidedness of the reporting is less significant than why Rupert Murdoch is so strident in his opposition to the Labour brand. In 2007, the Murdoch newspapers endorsed Kevin Rudd. What did Kevin, what did Kevin 07 do or not do to, to lose that endorsement? Hey, Tom Watson, I'll start with you on this, although you probably can't answer that specific <laughs> question. No. The general point is that uh, Rupert Murdoch has shifted and changed from time to time. He did the same with British Labour. He backed yeah. Tony Blair when he came to power. That's right. And to David, that's a very fair point. And my, my assessment of this, having looked at how the company operate in the UK, is that Rupert Murdoch backs, has backed left and right part, p politicians. He doesn't back parties, he backs politicians. And to him, it's all about the business. And he clearly has a business interest in the outcome of this election, otherwise he wouldn't be so stridently wanting you to vote for one candidate and not giving readers the kind of dignity to make their own decision based on fair reporting of the election. And, you know, I saw those kind of covers. It reminded me of a very close election we had in the UK in 1992 where the outcome was uncertain at the start of the election, the polls were sort of tightening, and he traduced the character of the leader of one party such that... By the end of it, he was almost destroyed in the eyes of voters. And it, it was such a cynical move. It demeaned democracy. It insulted the intelligence of voters. And it's corrosive for any sort of for politics. And I just think you deserve better than that. You deserve newspapers that give you a fair crack of the whip and a fair, fair reporting of the issues in an election. And that's not what you're seeing in the Murdoch papers in this election. Kelly O'Dwyer. Thank, I want to thank David for that question and all I can say is from that question uh, it, it makes me think that Bill Shorten must be an agent of Rupert Murdoch because Kevin Rudd clearly lost the confidence of Bill Shorten as he did a number of members of the Labor Party who tore him down as Prime Minister. So if you're talking about losing confidence, um, that happened. And then, of course, Bill, I know you, you, you changed your mind and you tore down Julie Gillard and reinstalled Kevin Rudd. So, I mean, I, I would like to just point out the fact that 
could it be, could it be that this reportage is reflective of the fact that this government is simply not a good government? This government has increased. <laughs> this, government, yeah. this government has increased our debt to unprecedented levels. Gross debt now is going to crash through the gross debt ceiling of $300 billion. Um, I know that there has been reportage that is very uncomfortable for people like Bill, reportage in New South Wales about Eddie O'Bead and the corruption scandals in New South Wales with the Labor Party. We've also had lots of scandals, including with the HSU, the Health Services Union, that involve a former president of the Labor Party and also involve a current serving member of the Labor Party in the parliament. Now, you talk about culture, Tom, and I want to know from you, do you think that is a sign of a toxic culture if that is invested in the Labor Party? I strongly believe in assertive journalism and, uh, and they've got to hold the likes of us to account. Uh, the, it, it's strong journalism that hold, keeps politics clean, but let me just ask you this question. Do you, would you feel comfortable with your leader, Mr Abbott, with his face superimposed onto a Nazi uniform on the front page of a tabloid newspaper? What would you say if it was... If it was <laughs> <laughs> Do not feel embarrassed. <laughs> With, with, with respect, I would, I would say to you, Tom, I mean, there are lots of things that we might not like with a free media, but unfortunately, unfortunately, that's the price. That is okay. the price no, of I'm democracy. No, I'm to and and I, you don't, if, if you don't appreciate Sorry. the fact that this is one of the basic tenets no, of I democracy... I don't think... Okay, no, 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 I'll go right across the other side. We Look, haven't heard Sally I mean, Warhart of this. A lot's been said, but this has been an orchestrated campaign. This has been... Uh, what I found interesting about it, all the tabloids have been mentioned. This idea that it isn't orchestrated. What's happened at The Australian during this election campaign has interested me because it's supposed to be the best broadsheet national newspaper in the country. I know we don't have very many. Uh, <laughs> but it took until last Wednesday for there to be a single piece that was a critique uh, of an uh, Abbott policy. Uh, and it was Paul Kelly last Wednesday uh, writing about the paid parental leave scheme. Uh, I think he would have been a very lonely man that day uh, because right underneath that piece was a very well drawn but absolutely horrible cartoon, and I'm all for satire and humour, but a bit like the Nazi image in the tabloid, uh, it was Kevin Rudd as Hannibal Lecter. And, you know, underneath the only single critique that I have been able to see so far um, in the Australian, and that bothers me greatly. I, I just think it's become indefensible. I I'm not somebody that says, um, we, you know, I can't wait till Rupert Murdoch retires. Uh, I, I don't say that. I, I say what we need are more Rupert Murdochs, but with different ideas. It is only power crazy, rich, stinking rich media barons that are ever going to fund newspapers anymore. And when Rupert goes to media mogul heaven, it's not like there's going to be anybody lining up to buy these papers and keep these journalists employed and keep the whole thing going. But when, when the, the Australian behaves like this every day, day in, day out, I just, it's indefensible. OK, they'll show up a series of things you probably want to respond to. Um, yeah. Going back to uh, David Anderson's question, what are the motives, what's happened? First of all, let's just lay down a marker, which I suspect most on the panel, if not all, will agree on, first of all. There's a lot of journalists, there's a lot of people who work in newspapers who don't all share the same particular editorial line, and I appreciate that fact. There's a lot of people just trying to work very hard, write stories, write news, hold both sides of politics to account. That's fair enough. But there's clearly some commercial imperative being played out here. People don't just make actions, run newspapers out of philanthropy or generosity. So clearly, at some point, um, there's been a view formed that the Labor Party is inimicable, unfriendly to the interests of uh, the commercial agenda. Uh, now, you could form that view for Kelly to give you 10 reasons why that's the case, which is entirely legitimate. I just make the observation that when you sell 70% of all the newspapers in Australia, when you clearly take a particular point of view, 
when polls become news, and what happens is a newspaper will have a poll. And that is the only story that most newspapers can break ahead of the internet these days, their polls. Then they breathlessly interview themselves about what the polls mean and we wait for the next set of polls so they can <laughs> re-interview themselves again. But in between all of that, the... you knife a Prime Minister, oh. you know, in reacting to the polls. Did you vote for Malcolm Turnbull or Tony yeah. Abbott? Well, um... I wasn't in the Parliament. I wasn't in the Parliament. <laughs> so, the point I'm making is that print is under pressure. I like newspapers. I like the feel of newspapers. Um, I still buy newspapers, even if I read it, go, oh my goodness. Um, because I think, it, I think newspapers are important. But I also get that now with the internet, a lot of people don't get their news on the newspapers anymore. So what we're seeing is the print media trying to make a profit. So perhaps they think that by just clearly backing one side over the other, that'll sell more papers. I don't know. Uh, what I also know is that with these polls, polls are now running, it seems, everything. People always breathlessly say, what, what's your reaction to the polls? I think, well, a newspaper prints a poll so it can interview itself about the poll and then we have to read next week's sequel to this poll. Every other, this is the only, it's one of the few stories newspapers can break. Okay, Bill, uh, Shorten, you've, you've made that point before, so I'm going to interrupt okay. you and very briefly... Well, I'll finish. Yeah, okay. sure, very briefly, uh, to pick up Kelly O'Dwyer's point. I mean, you've mm. just laid out a conspiracy theory mm. for why Rupert Murdoch is against you, but is it really so outrageous to imagine oh. that he could have decided, as your colleagues did, that Kevin Rudd is not a good Prime Minister? Well, I'm just... I'll take my life in my own hands, <laughs> Tony. And well, no, you I'll, amongst them. I'll answer your question. First of all, I didn't say that there's a conspiracy per se. I'm saying that there may be... Com there's commercial reasons. That's what I said. Then I said, and there could be valid reasons. I said that Kelly could probably list 10 very sensible reasons why the paper has formed the view it has. My observation is print media in this country is struggling. My observation is that it's a well-known fact that print media is uh, battling to make profits. So all I'm just saying is that when you sell 70% of all the newspapers in Australia, I'm just saying that there's commercial objectives at work which aren't necessarily objectives about having the best democracy in this country or who should run this country or form a government. I know, though, that, it's, that the travails that Labor have are not all the fault of newspapers, OK? So I get that. No, there's no issue with that. I understand that. But what I understand is that in an election, Australians deserve to hear more than just the latest poll and the latest cheap headline. The issues in this country which make us potentially the best country in the world go to who's got the best policy on jobs, who's got the best policy on schools, who's got the best policy on hospitals. This country deserves better than some of the reportage, which may have whatever reason you've got for the reportage we get, but this country in this election shouldn't just be decided upon the front pages of tabloid newspapers. OK, thank you. OK, it is less than 12 days to the election. You're watching Q&A. The next question comes from Timothy Mannix. Hi. My question is for the um, whole panel. Um, given that the fact-checking website, politifact.com.au, within the first two weeks of the election campaign, has found over 70% of both Tony Abbott and Kevin Rudd's claims that they've looked at on the campaign trail so far to straddle somewhere between half true and completely false, can the panel offer an explanation as to why politicians seem not to be held to the same professional standards of honesty and integrity as other professions? As a teacher, if I were to teach students something that was deemed half true or completely false, I would be fired. Why is it that when it comes to politics, honesty is, never seems to be the best policy? Sally Warhafer, start with you. It's a great question, um, and I suspect the answer is because they think they can get away with it, and they are getting away with it. Uh, and because it partly gets back to what we've just been discussing, that there's, there's uh, not enough reporting uh, and too much opinion. So, I mean, I, I, it's interesting that it's a new thing in this election. The fact everyone's got one, the, you know, ABC's got one, and <laughs> The Conversation's got one, and I'm sure Fairfax has got one, and. Bill, you've probably got one, uh, but nobody. We've got is, one. We've got one on the Liberals. Nobody's, um, nobody's really um, taking it. it. We hear it, in fact, uh, with the government, 
their $70 billion on, uh, you know, the, the black hole, the, the funding that the coalition will have to make up. And they say $70 billion and Saul S. Lake says $30 billion. And, and we're just left to think, well, it's billions. <laughs> yep, it's okay. a lot of money. Yeah. Tim Wilson. Well, there are two parts of this question. The first part, of course, is uh, advertising related. And the politicians have somehow miraculously excluded themselves from uh, being bound by honesty codes that they imply, uh, impose on other uh, normal advertising, which enables them to put out advertising which uh, repeats myths and, and fabrications left, right and centre. That's what happens when you give them control of the laws. Uh, and the second part is ultimately because Ultimately, because as Sally's absolutely 100% spot on, they can get away with it. They think that uh, you are dumb, they think that you can't think for yourself, and they think that they can repeat things often enough and that eventually you will believe them. I mean, the term fact in itself is, is very difficult because if you actually look at these website fact-checking groups, uh, they often look at contentions or propositions or projections of what, for instance, costings and things will be. But invariably, there's very little room to actually prove whether they're accurate or not. And sometimes they include things that are accurate but need a bit more information. That tends not to mean that they're factually incorrect. It just means that context needs to be added. And the only way that we can hold politicians to account is if we have a well-informed and engaged citizen like the people here tonight. Tom Watson, uh, the, the, the British are a little ahead of uh, us in terms of fact-checking uh, during elections. Has it been useful during election campaigns? Has it worked? Has it changed debates? Yeah, it, it has. Uh, actually, we've got a big row in the UK about the use of national statistics, and our own body that co compiles statistics has been very critical when you know, partial reporting of statistics is used in political speeches and it's, it's, they've been calling politicians out and that works. And, you know, but I want to, you know, be a little bit easy on, uh, on Bill and Kelly here. You know, there's an election on, they're setting out their stall, they want their policies, you know, they're trying to sort of convince you that they've got the best policies and, um, you, you know, you've, you've got to hold them to account, you've got to engage in that. And you, the debate we had about newspapers is part of that process, but also, um, you know, the rise of social media means that, if one of these facts is incorrect, people are on it straight away and it, hold, it brings an election alive. So you raising that point makes it harder for those mistakes to be made. But, um, you know, politicians want to convince you that they've got the best policies and they're trying to, trying to have a positive election campaign. Kelly O'Dwyer. Well, look, I don't think that people, whether it's Bill or myself or anybody else, I don't think that people set out to deliberately try and mislead. Um, I, I, I don't think that you do that, Bill, deliberately. But, uh, I mean, sometimes you probably do. I'll give you the same benefit of the doubt. In, in, in <laughs> I'm essence. Not but, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> but the point... <laughs> I'm sure you don't. The point I... Uh, the point I want to make is that that's where free media comes in. Um, in addition to, as Tom's mentioned, social media, I, I think it's quite right that you have a media that holds a mirror up to the government of the day and the opposition of the day, you should be held to account. Being in government is a very difficult and very important job. It should be hard. You should be held to account. So, for so the can, I, can I ask you? Can I just throw make? in a question there? Do the, does the fact checking, uh, do all these fact checkers, make you do more homework? Well, look, I, I think they, they play a role. I mean, I don't know who fact-checks the fact-checkers, and I'm not sure that people are fully aware of exactly who's behind some of these fact-checking units. But do I think it plays a role in the political discourse? I, I do. But does it, does it put um, you it more on your toes? Probably? Does it put you more on your toes? Well, I think then? you should always be on your toes, Tony. And, um, uh, and I think anybody who's engaged in public life, knowing that uh, anything that you say can be recorded or played back at you, I think everybody's very conscious of trying to do their very, very best to make sure that what they say is accurate. Bill Shorten. I, um, I think the uh, Polyfact and the other fact-checking services are a net improvement to our politics. I welcome the idea that you've got to try and explain your views to someone and it doesn't just have to be a clever three-word slogan, that you actually have to have an argument, dare I say, a costed policy. Um, <laughs> But, so I think it's okay. I'd also just say to you as a teacher, though, um, I don't think politicians are dishonest. I don't, politicians are not dishonest. So you said that, oh, you know, if we acted like them, we'd all get sacked. I just want to correct your loss of faith there. It's not quite as bad as you think. But I will say something about teachers. Teachers deserve the best policies from both political parties. You're a teacher. 
we're offering six years of extra funding in our better schools. The Coalition are offering four. That's a fact. Check it. It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our next question is from Caitlin Spence. Caitlin Spence. As a young woman, I am looking to enter the workforce in the next two years. I am prepared to work hard and be successful. My dream is to one day have a family, but my fear is that people like you, Mr Sean, and the Labor Party are attacking women who have been successful and will qualify for the Coalition's pay parental scheme. As I see it, it is a fair scheme because it gives all women the same pay as their regular wages, no more, no less, and it's for six months, the recommended minimum time to breastfeed a new baby. How can you call that unfair? We'll start, we'll start with you, obviously. I think that you're entering the workforce at the best time for women in Australia, and that successive generations of women before you have had to battle to get conditions which, frankly, uh, they should have received, but have taken a lot of effort to get. But what I can't quite agree with your well, with your well articulated point is that somehow Labor has been delinquent in terms of standing up for the rights of women in the workplace. It was Labor who changed the Fair Work Act to introduce the ability for people to run an equal pay case. The equal pay case doesn't mean two people in the same, doing the same job getting equal pay. That was one in the 70s by the Labor movement. But what this means is that in industries where there's a predominantly feminised workforce, uh, they, their work is frequently undervalued compared to uh, industries where there's predominantly male employees. Because of a Labor government in the community services sector, for the first time, the emotional work which is done in community services, where not only do you have to work physically and intellectually, but you've got to commit emotionally because the people who depend upon you take their well-being cues from how you are, has always been undervalued. Teaching is probably in the same category, I suggest. Because of Labor, there was the ability for the Australian Services Union to run an equal pay case, and now we're going to see phased in equal pay for women. Another example of what we're doing which helps women... Can I just bring you to the question oh. that was asked, though? Because specifically, <laughs> and, and if I could... <laughs> oh, well, the question was about fairness. Can I pose it to you in this way? Does the Tony Abbott scheme pay low-paid women and medium income women more than your scheme? My answer is based on answering Caitlin's point as well as yours is let's just recognise that Labor's done a bit already in this term of government. Sure, but that's, a simple, that's a simple question. Okay. Do, does, it is a simple does their question. Scheme, but... Does their scheme, it's about fairness, does their scheme pay low paid women more than your scheme? No, we're paying a universal amount. Well, we're paying a, we pay the same amount to all women. And what we recognise with that is that we want to provide a safety net. Many of the companies which you may work for in the future, Caitlin, already have their schemes in place. Why should a taxpayer pay 75k when their own company is already able to pay it and we only pay pensioners $19,000? I would suggest that if we want to genuinely help gender wage equality, which was the basis of your question, then what we need to do is do what Labor's doing, which is increase super from 9 to 12, because women have less saved in their working careers, and the Libs are going to freeze it at 9 and a quarter. OK, can I just interrupt? Did you say no my question to my question? Did you say no? Just repeat fact, your question again. My, well, it's a very simple question. No, you said Does Tony that. Abbott's scheme pay more to low-paid women than your scheme? No, what it does is for well-paid women, it pays more. Okay, all right. I've got to go <laughs> well, to, well, to... I want to hear the answer to this, I, because this is part of the fact-checking we're doing. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think okay. Bill, you're going to be fact-checked on this point. And, Caitlin, it's a very, very good question. The answer to your question, Tony, is yes, they do get paid more. They get paid $5,000 more. And if Bill read the policy and read our policy, he would realise as well that women are entitled to paid parental leave as a workplace entitlement rather than a welfare payment. A replacement wage, capped, but a replacement wage that means that women are able to be 
able to look after their children for a six month period of time, but also to remain connected to the workforce. Under our scheme, it's better for low paid women, it's better for average paid women, it's better for all women, because it also allows for superannuation to be paid to those women. Now, Bill likes to talk a lot about superannuation. I do. In our scheme, in our scheme we actually pay superannuation entitlements. The real unfairness in comparison between our scheme and Labor scheme is that under the Labor scheme, they're prepared to pay public servants more than a shopkeeper, more than a cafe worker, more than a factory worker because they're under a different scheme. In fact, they, under their scheme, will allow people to double dip. In Bill's own department, um, you get 14 weeks of replacement wage with your superannuation, and then you can double dip under the Labor scheme. And I'd like to know, why is that fair, Bill? Why is that fair that those okay, people right. who are you, paying you pose the taxes... A, you pose a question. Let's see the answer. And I'll come to the other panellists. Go ahead. Kelly's right, I do like to talk about superannuation, so I'll address that part of the uh, observation first. Try and answer the question first. <laughs> there are three and a half million Australians who earn less than $37,000 a year. That passes my test of low paid. 2.1 million of these three and a half million Australians, you can keep fact checking this, it's all correct, are women. 2.1 million. Now we believe that women do not have the same savings and superannuation as men throughout their whole of the working life, whether or not they've had children. Women don't get the same deal on super. That's a fact. So what Labor did is we abolished the 15% contributions tax. So what used to happen is that uh, if you earn less than $37,000 a year, you pay 15% tax on your superannuation contributions. We got rid of that. So that benefits 2.1 million low-paid women. That is why I say that we have got a fair income policy in terms of low-paid women, in terms of their retirement savings, and generally on superannuation. We are lifting superannuation, if we're re-elected, from 9 to 12 per cent. The Coalition want to park it at 9 okay, and a quarter. All right. No, no made, this is important because okay, Kelly made a personal okay. reference. All right. I'll deal with it quickly. Briefly. Kelly said, oh, Bill Shorten wants to see people who've already negotiated an industrial instrument. You know, they've already got a condition. Yeah, they have. But what I find amazing is we want to lift super for 8.5 million Australians, many of them women, from 9 to 12 per cent. The Liberal Party vote against it. They're going to freeze it at 9 and a quarter. And they get 15 per cent. So they want 15 per cent, but their hands go up in the parliament to stop the rest of Australia going from 9 to 12 okay. per cent. That's right. hypocritical. You do realise that money comes out of people's own pockets. The workers who work for that Do you accept that, that they voted against 15% well, I don't know so whether they voted against it, but what <laughs> I know... But you what I, know, yeah, totally what, what I know is that people who pay the superannuation... Okay, it's this was a question in, about yeah. women. I, I'm sorry, yeah, can I, 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 I... I would actually like women. to bring everyone back and to the question. We we'll we'll hear from about, Go ahead. And what I would like to say uh, in answer to your question is that in a perfect world, or if we were back in the world of Gough Whitlam, or if the mining boom was never going to end, you know, the idea of paying in a non-means-tested policy $75,000 to families or, you know, or individuals who just may not need it. It is so confusing. We've got Tony Abbott telling us that we're in a crisis, a budget crisis. It's going to be cutting spending. We've got to look for savings everywhere we can. At a time like that, to decide to put so much money into six months, you know what? It takes about 18 years to raise a kid. And every single parent I talk to, every one of them, whether they're rich, poor, in between, they say childcare. They say, who is going to fix up this antiquarian idea that school finishes at 3.30. Guess who do the pickups? Mums. Right? Who's adjusting their working hours so that mothers can actually work a full day and don't have to be buying aftercare or feeling guilty as parents? These are the issues that last for years, not chucking out billions of dollars for six months and then it's all gone. Okay, I'll bring Tim Wilson in. 
Um, what's your view on the paid parental leave scheme? Because it's the biggest entitlement scheme we've seen in many, many years. Certainly. And, uh, it and it's coming from a government that says, or an opposition that says, the age of entitlement is over. Well, before I say anything else, Sally's absolutely right. It is a question about women, but it's also a question about every Australian and who picks up the bill for these things and the benefits that go not just to women, but of course the men who are in their lives as well. And I just want to quickly make the Sorry, point... Sorry, is that about the poor blokes that have to no, pay no, no, the taxes Sally, to pay Sally, for it? I, I don't... don't so, I Sally... Don't, but I don't get it. No, no, I, the, the point is this. We live in a society where everybody plays a part and everybody should pay some tax. And we have to recognise that it isn't just about taking from one group and giving to another group. And I don't think, and this comes back to the point that was made before earlier, Bill, that the taxpayers of Australia should have a worse scheme or a worse beneficial arrangement than those people who are in the public service who they paid their wages for. Mm. Irrespective of my view on the PPL, <laughs> taxpayers shouldn't be treated worse off than bureaucrats. So then will you get but hang on, but what I'm going to say... Just, just I'm, settle, not sure you can, I'm not sure that's consistent with no, some no, other well, policies. It, well, it, that's my position. OK. But on that, uh, the PPL to me is a very bad scheme, and I make no ambiguity about okay. it. And it's not just uh, this scheme. There are lots of welfare schemes I don't support. Sorry, and, I, I didn't and, mean to interrupt you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't support it because I think it fundamentally changes the principle of uh, uh, how our society is constructed. What we're hearing more and more of is we need to do, introduce this welfare scheme because it is good for the economy. Or we need to introduce this scheme because it is good pro for productivity. I'm sorry, individuals don't live their lives to serve the economy or to serve productivity. I believe in a classical liberal society where everybody's encouraged from the bottom up to live their lives and to pursue their own goals and dreams and not be slaves just to those objectives. The second reason... No, don't get, we no, actually no, want to get no, another question. The, se so the second reason I oppose it is because I despise this attitude that is creeping into society where we increasingly look at children as a burden and not a blessing. And people have choices in their lives. People have choices in their lives and they have to live with the consequences of it, both positive and negative. And the idea that children now are a burden that has to be buttressed by society, and this includes other policies as well, to me, I find basically but offensive. Tim, the burden of child raising and child care has always fallen unevenly on women, and you cannot deny that. I cannot deny that. In the same way, okay. I cannot deny The right side of my brain is going very it. fast. The left side so you needs You know as well to... as I know right, that that mm. is not my choice that women Tim, have children. Tim, let's, well, let's just... It's let's not. <laughs> it is it's genetic. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have lost the crowd. OK, I'm, I'm, so I'm going to close well, it down there. Sorry, because we actually have quite a few other questions on different right. subjects to deal with. Let's move along. Our next question comes from Ryan Hollingsworth. Why they have children than, oh. than, than OK. <laughs> Another question for Bill Shorten. Uh, how does Labor expect businesses to remain profitable and continue in, to employ Australians when unions overprice workers and are more interested in protesting disrupting progress and generally avoiding actually working altogether while earning top dollar. Are unions pricing Australia out of work and sending companies overseas, if not shutting them down completely? OK, we've got a few questions to get through. Let's try and keep our answers brief. Thank you. All right. There's a few assumptions in that. First of all, um, wages in Australia are moving reasonably at between 3.2 and 3.5%. We're not getting overrun by wage claims in Australia. Secondly, the assumption that everyone's on strike is not correct. Uh, the, the average industrial period of lost time, to use a pretty basic measure, is one third of what it was in the Labor five and a half years compared to the Howard ten and a half years. So strikes are down, wages are moving moderately, and for the record, productivity, Labor productivity has been up for the last seven quarters. So when we say that doesn't excuse every individual malfeasance, of course not, of course not. But let's not run a myth in Australia that somehow the workers are out to smoke and then lunch, and then afternoon smoke and then off home again. Australians are working pretty hard, uh, and there is not an epidemic of industrial action. What does matter in Australia is making sure not so much how do you sack people, but how do you keep people. That's why, despite the competing views about what is a family-friendly workplace, 
That is the workplace relations debate of the future. How do we get and encourage greater uh, participation by women in our economy? How do we make sure there's less discrimination against older people when they're searching for a job or to get another chance in their 50s and 60s? How do we make sure that people with disabilities don't get overlooked? The challenges in Australia and productivity are at the enterprise level, and the Libs, you know, the, the, the Libs are a bit uh, conflicted on this. On one hand, they say there's a militancy productivity whatever issue, blah, blah, blah and that's not borne out by the facts. On the other hand, they say, we'll be a light touch. I don't trust the Liberals on industrial relations. I think a lot of them think like some of the assumptions in that question, that we're paying our workers too much. There's been a recent argument about apprentices, that apprentices pay for first and second year shouldn't have gone up by 5%. What it means, this decision, when you strip aside all the headlines, is that someone who's got a year 12 qualification and is doing first year apprenticeship will get paid $10.49 an hour. Somehow some people say that's the end of the Western civilization as we know it. I'm not buying that logic. Okay, all right. Our next question is also on industrial relations. <laughs> From William Olson. William Olson. Good evening. My colleagues and I in the hospitality industry, as well as other low-paying industries, who live off of and absolutely love our uh, penalty rates and other entitlements, are scared of losing them should, uh, should Tony Abbott and the Liberal Party get elected. Where do we actually believe that, that uh, Mr. Abbott is for the average worker in Australia as opposed to big business itself? Kelly O'Dwyer. Well, Will, thanks very much for the question. It's, um, it's a good question and a fair question. And the reason for that is because there has been a massive scare campaign that's been run by the Labor Party. The Labor Party would like you to believe <laughs> that, uh, that somehow all workers' entitlements are up for grabs, that that the, the, the whole country is going to be changed, the people are going to be sacked. It's all untrue. And if it was polyfact checked, um, it would be demonstrated to be completely untrue. There is no chance that work choices will be reintroduced. Um, that has been said you know, on more than one occasion. And I think it's very, very clear that Tony Abbott means what he says and does what he says. Can you um, guarantee that? A a absolutely, I can guarantee that. Okay. Hold you to it. Well, I just want to just also add, there's three reasons why we say you should be concerned. One, it's called work choices. Three of the four Howard government work choices ministers who championed it are still there. They're still there. Under work choices, penalty rates did get slashed. Now, if you don't accept that, if you accept that a leopard can change its spots, if you accept that the rhetoric of decades of the Liberal Party against penalty rates has all of a sudden changed because their polling's told them to change it. My second observation is have a look at the conduct of Liberal state governments in recent years when they've got elected. They sack people, they go after conditions. You know, they're not good employers. Just ask a teacher in the government okay, system Bill, in this yeah, state. Yeah, uh, okay. And the third thing is purely this. Okay. Purely right. this. Sorry, okay. The opposition has said, oh, we won't change the law, Fair Work Act, on penalty rates. Well, of course they won't because penalty rates aren't set in the Fair Work Act, always look at the detail. They have said that they're open to support employer submissions to change penalty rates. All right. That's what okay, they've all said. Right. Well, it, take that back to it, Kelly O'Dwyer. And can, well, can we add to it, the, the earlier question was whether Australian workers are overpaid because of union interference. Do you think that is the case? Well, well first let me respond to what Bill said. And, and yep. it's a really desperate attempt. It's a grubby, desperate smear that is being perpetuated by the Labor Party to try and cling on to power. And, and I think it really it demeans you, Bill, in actually perpetuating mm. this, and I think it demeans your government to not actually run on your own record. If but you, you can't win the do election, that I hope because you've got you actually the, don't have you win the a election, record to run on. If you, you don't have a positive I statement. Your well, well, I mean, you're, you're interrupting me. That's why so. I said I beg your pardon. <laughs> OK. Um, the, the point I would make is that, that Australians are going to be better off under an Abbott government. And that is because we understand that everybody should have the opportunity to lead fulfilling okay. lives, that we do this by growing the economy. In the previous Howard government, we doubled household wealth. Uh, this was a good thing for people. It gave them choice about their lives, about their businesses, about their families. Um, we believe that it's not a zero-sum game, as the Labor Party seems to think, that you need to take from one to give to another. In the economy, you can actually grow the pie. We want to restore confidence to the economy so that people can actually employ other people, particularly 
in small business. Um, small business is one of the engine rooms of our economy. We want to give small business the confidence to again employ people. That's the best opportunity that we will provide, particularly to young people who are finding it now so difficult to okay. find a job under this government where unemployment is going to be going up and 800,000 Australians will be unemployed next year. And that's the government's own figures. OK, I'm going to come to our other panellists. Tom Watson. I think, uh, I think the last three questions from Caitlin, Ryan and William, all, all of them are sort of... You re really, you're asking, what kind of a future have I got in this economy? And, you know, I'm an outsider. I've been in Australia for three days. But I just want to say to you, <laughs> you live in one hell of a great country. You've had, here. You've had 22 years of unencumbered economic growth. And the fact that Caitlin can see parties of left and right arguing about how best women in the workplace will be supported, and William can talk about rights for the low paid, is because you've got a great economy and you should feel proud about that. One thing I'll say that in the UK, the experience in the UK that when we liberalised our labour laws, it was always the lowest paid workers that were hit the hardest. That's right. They're the ones that were exploited and they're the ones who uh, are undermined in the workplace and that's not good for any civilised society. So you should, uh, re you should revere those rights because they're very important in the workplace. Jim Wilson, briefly. Well, sadly, I think the coalition is going to disappoint me because they're not going to pursue the sorts of industrial relations reform that I'd like to see that actually promotes the idea that individuals can engage with their employers in contracts and uh, pursue industrial relations agendas that suit them and come up with negotiated arrangements based on uh, their terms and conditions uh, that meet their own approval rather than constantly being locked out of arrangements because unions decide outcomes or, uh, or collective bargain on their behalf without a choice. OK, we're, we're nearly out of time. We've got a question from Georgina Moore. Hello, Bill Shorten. Hello. Myself and the Australian public have felt betrayed by your removal of the elected Prime Ministers, Kevin Rudd and then Julia Gillard, both of which you were instrumental in orchestrating. As a politician with obvious career leadership ambitions, how do you feel that the Australian people's tainted perception of you will affect your possible career? leadership ambitions. And Changing from Julia Gillard to Kevin Rudd was very difficult, as I've even said on this show before. Very difficult. But the Labor Party, and indeed the nation, need, and the nation should have competitive politics from both sides. And the Labor Party needed to be competitive at this election. One thing which, I have to say, Georgina, as much as you've got your legitimate view, is for me the idea of Tony Abbott controlling the Senate of Australia and the House of Representatives and having unfettered power, yeah, well, that is not something which I can easily live with. And we owe it, people like myself owe it, to the Labor Party and also more generally to Australia to make the Labor Party the most competitive choice it can be. And I believe in this election, even though we're still the underdog, even though there's uh, plenty of people with plenty to say about us in the newspapers, when you actually look at the positive policies we've got, better schools, which will see proper funding, national disability insurance, lifting people's retirement income for a superannuation, promoting jobs, we are competitive. OK, Bill, short, I'm going to just bring you back quickly to uh, the question and to... Well, the, actually, the question's got a hand up. Quickly go back to you. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I think... Julia Gillard was elected and she had a mandate to do all her policies that she did and Kevin Rudd hasn't had a mandate to implement, you know, national, um, the Northern Territory scheme that he's implementing now. So I think we all wanted the opportunity to remove Julie Gillard, and when Kevin Rudd oh, was sorry for that. Prime Minister, we okay. wanted to remove him too. Yeah, you stole <laughs> everyone's <laughs> choice. <laughs> well, okay, I have Bill, to say, Bill. that was honestly put, Georgina, that you wanted to vote these Labor people out. Well, I'll tell you what, I want to make... I don't believe Tony Abbott should run this country. And just as you believe that uh, you didn't want those two Labor people running Australia, I think what you've said confirms to me that Labor should be competitive. We, should, we owe it to our supporters and to this democracy to make every effort to provide a real choice. At the end of the day, one side or the other will win this election, but I know one thing, this country never functions well when any side of politics has got absolute power of the Senate and the House of Representatives, 
and that's what I believe. Bill Shorten, while we've got you here... <laughs> we're virtually... We're almost out of time, but can you confirm yeah. Pam Williams' account in the financial review of your secret meeting with Kevin Rudd on the night of the midwinter ball <laughs> in relation to this oh. whole issue of... Tony, of it's a Jordan. matter of public record that I supported Kevin Rudd, as Georgina identified. Mm. What I know in this election... Will you confirm... Is I'm not going to rake over... Will you just confirm that... Tony... It's part of Labor history now, and clearly right. other people involved in those meetings have talked about them. Can you confirm whether got, or not... There's nothing I'm going to add to a story about that in the fin. What I'm interested in is using a show like this to debate the ideas about the future of this country, Anyone can ask any question, but I can just again say to those Labor voters and those who are undecided, if you think that disability is important, have a look at Labor's runs on the board. If you think schools are important, have a look at our runs on the board. Thank you very much. That is all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Sally Warhaf, Bill Shorten, Tim Wilson, Tom Watson and Kelly O'Dwyer. And our special thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Our special thanks to our hosts at the Melbourne Writers' Festival, the Deacon Edge and this wonderful Melbourne audience. Give yourselves a quick round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Now, next Monday on Q&A, Kevin Rudd will answer your questions, but he will do it alone. The Prime Minister has agreed to share the stage with the man who wants his job, the Opposition Leader, Tony Abbott. At this point, the Opposition Leader hasn't responded to our invitation to join this special <laughs> Q&A debate. But if Mr Abbott... Excuse me, but if Mr Abbott doesn't agree to participate, Mr Rudd will face the audience in a one-man show, and we're offering the same opportunity to Mr Abbott. So until next week's Q&A, whatever shape it takes, good night.